everyone. So my name is Dr. Kandar. I am a neurologist, and I'm not going to go over my credentials, but I wanted to thank everyone, uh, particularly the Alzheimer's Association, for inviting me to speak here today. That being said and done, I do want to state that I have no disclosures, but I do have to disclose my dream last night. Um, I dreamt that I actually attended this, and there was not a single patient here because everyone had short-term memory loss. And then, and then I started thinking, well, do I have short-term memory loss? Am I in the right location? So that was my dream. Of course, I woke up in a panic with a big sweat. But luckily, you guys are all here today, and I'm happy to see such a nice turnout. That being said and done, <laughs> that being said and done, I um, actually want to first disclose that I usually, I usually don't have too many slides when I give a presentation. I found in the years of giving talks that I typically lose people after about 15 or 20 minutes of a unidirectional talk to where I'm the only one speaking and people start to kind of nod off in about 15, 20 minutes. So I really want to encourage this to be a very dynamic discussion. And I find that's going to be most helpful and you guys will retain more and be able to take more information home with you. So really, I only have about 13 to 15 slides, and we're going to use that as a framework to discuss what Parkinson's disease is, what Parkinson's disease dementia is, what Lewy body dementia is, and the difference between the two. It is a step away from and different from Alzheimer's disease. So you've heard a lot about Alzheimer's already probably for the morning, maybe a little bit more this afternoon. But these are other forms of dementia that are also not as common, but, but certainly um, uh, fairly common. So again, the objectives of the talk today is that we're going to discuss the clinical features of Parkinson's disease. We will discuss the cognitive changes that we see in Parkinson's disease, the clinical criteria for diagnosing Lewy body dementia, as well as distinguishing between the two. Now, how many people have heard of Parkinson's? And how many people have heard of dementia with Lewy body disease? Oh, wow. Because I had this whole thing talking about how most people don't know the one that <laughs> we'll let that go. Okay. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, so first things first, do we have a microphone ready for people? Before we begin, does anyone have any questions before I start with what the clinical features of Parkinson's disease? Because it may actually shift direction for us when it comes to the talk. Okay. So, what is Parkinson's? Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative condition. What is a neurodegenerative condition? It's a neurological condition that actually causes changes over time, progression over time. That means how you view someone, examine someone, and clinically uh, diagnose someone today may be very different five years from now or ten years from now. Their symptoms would have changed, typically for the worse. That does not imply that we don't have treatment. It just implies that it's progressive, and most neurodegenerative cases do not have a cure. But then again, neither does the common cold. Now, typically, we tend to view Parkinson's disease from a motor standpoint. So we th when we think of Parkinson's, we kind of tend to imagine Muhammad Ali or Michael J. Fox. I'm sure you both are, are you all aware that the two of them have Parkinson's disease and have become now the face of that condition. So you think about Muhammad Ali's tremor in the 96 Olympics when he lit the torch in Atlanta. Or you think about Michael J. Fox's dyskinesia or those twisting, turning movements that he gets when he's on television or making statements in front of Congress. Um, but the cardinal features of Parkinson's tend to be these four. Number one, resting tremor. What does that mean? Resting tremor is a tremor that's most noticeable when the hand is at rest. It doesn't necessarily have to be the hand. It can be the hand, it could be the leg. Typically, it's the hand, though. Of those Parkinson patients who have a resting tremor, 90% of the time, it's going to be in the hand. However, not every Parkinson patient has tremor. So just because you come to the physician and you don't have tremor does not mean you may not have Parkinson's if the other features seem to be in line with Parkinson's. So to give you a visual example, a resting tremor looks like this. Okay. It's a non-frequent, so it's actually relatively slow, even though it might look like it's fast. Compared to other tremor disorders, it tends to be one of the slowest. Um, so it's a relatively slow uh, oscillating hand tremor. It tends to occur at the level of the wrist, so going back and forth at the level of the wrist, or at the level of the fingertips, what they classically used to call a pill rolling tremor. Okay? That's back from apothecary days, well before my time, maybe even before yours. 
So resting tremor could be an initial symptom. It may be the first sign that you have something that might be Parkinson's disease. Typically, a resting tremor improves when you actively do something. So you have the patient shift hands or hold something or bring their hands up to somewhat of a different position or hand right. That tremor should get better. Over time, it could get worse, but usually we do certain things in the examination to see whether it's mainly at rest or mainly with action. Okay? So that's the difference between an action tremor and a resting tremor. So an action tremor tends to occur when you're actively doing something, tying your shoelaces, doing up your buttons, shaving, combing your hair, putting on makeup, cutting up vegetables, bringing a soup spoon to your mouth. And that usually is indicative of different type of tremor disorders. So to give you an example, there is such a, di a diagnosis as essential tremor, which is a genetically inherited tremor disorder. How many people have heard of essential tremor? Okay, so Catherine Hepburn had essential tremor, okay? She's the only real celebrity that we know of that has had essential tremor. There's many more people who've come forward with Parkinson's disease. Although, ironically, essential tremor may be up to 10 times as common as Parkinson's is. There's no celebrities. Um, so essential tremor looks like this. Much quicker, also tends to occur on both hands. Much more common than Parkinson's, which tends to be asymmetric, worse on one side than the other. So that's basically tremor in a nutshell. Any questions about tremor? Yes, please. The Very good question. So again, for those of you who didn't hear, the question was, is the tremor in the dominant hand or the non-dominant hand? And it's, it can be either or. That doesn't matter, that correct. Doesn't matter. correct. So, so here's the catch. Those people who have it in their dominant hand, they tend to have more functional impairment because it's the dominant side that's affected. For those people who happen to have tremor in the non-dominant hand, they tend to fare better because it's the non-dominant side. I mean, think about how often, for those of you who are right-handed, how often you use your left hand. It's really not as often. It's almost like a 90 or a 9 to 10, a 9 to 1 ratio. Okay, this, any other comment or questions about tremor? Back to Good question. So when the head shakes really fast, there's two things to try to tease out. Are we talking about a tremor? Or are we talking about something entirely different called dystonia? How many people have heard the term dystonia? Wow, you guys are a good crowd. <laughs> so dystonia is a sustained muscle contraction, okay? And where it's most apparent, or at least most visible, is gonna be in the neck. Why? Because this is the only place, or one of the only places, to where you have counteracting muscles working at the same time. Otherwise, her head would drop, okay? So you have anterior or front muscles working at the same time, contracting at the same time, as the posterior muscles, the muscles in the back of the neck. And your neck muscles are having to work overtime because you're holding up the head, which is far heavier than we give it credit for, okay? So sometimes in dystonia, I'll get to your question in a second. Sometimes in dystonia, what happens is the circuitry is off to where one set of muscles is overactive and the other can't compensate, but it wants to. So it's almost like a tug of war. One side pulls, the other side pulls back to normal. Pulls abnormally, pulls back to normal, and it looks like a tremor. But, and to, the, and to the average person, or maybe even to a general neurologist, it may be, it, they may think it's a tremor. But to a movement disorder specialist who actually understands the difference between the two, we may notice subtleties of non-rhythmicity. In dystonia, it won't be rhythmic. In tremor, it will be rhythmic. And typically, a Parkinson patient will not get neck tremor, they'll get jaw tremor. And the jaw tremor will coincide with the hand tremor. It'll be at the same frequency at the same time. I would love to mimic it, I can't. <laughs> but a dystonic head tremor, um, or just a dystonic uh, movement of the neck will be very arrhythmic. And the treatment will be very different. Typically for dystonia, we'll actually apply Botox into the neck to weaken the overactive muscles and normalize those muscles. So I'm sorry, you had a question? With this break, can you hear, would it be like, or the protruding, would it be like they forget my husband says sometimes I forget how to walk. So or he gets rigid right, and so he can't take a step. I'll get to the bradykinesia and the rigidity in just a second because I wanted to explain both before. <laughs> but there was, I think, one more question about tremor. Yes. Uh, my husband's been diagnosed with uh, benign essential tremor. Yes. And where we actually have the hand and the neck tremor. Yes. And his lips, where it may have to be 
job. Right. I noticed that that will happen at the same time. Right. So essential tremor patients uh, can get it both in the neck and in the jaw. Again, it depends on the frequency. Uh, so an essential tremor will actually be a higher frequency, faster than a Parkinson tremor. And you kind of have to look at it in context. Is it a resting tremor with the hands, or is it an action tremor with the hands? If it's mainly an action tremor, and since it's a genetically inherited condition, if other family members also have it, it's probably going to be essential tremor. That being said and done, unfortunately, many times, essential tremors misdiagnosed as Parkinson's and vice versa. Even if you went to the International Essential Tremor Foundation website, it's on the front page, on the home page of their website. I don't usually like the term benign essential tremor because it's not really benign. And I think it's an old school term helped to distinguish between what actually can be life-threatening and what isn't. But the, but the term benign gives the false impression that it's not functionally impairing when it can be terribly functionally impairing. Yes? It's just a statement. Thank you for mentioning that it's a resting tremor because that's often left out. Sure. When people describe a Parkinson's, they just call it tremor. Correct. And that becomes confusing. Right. And there's many different forms of tremor, which I thought would be important here if we're going to talk about Parkinson's to make that distinction. So thank you. So second thing, let's talk about bradykinesia and get to your question. So bradykinesia, it basically means slowness of movement. Okay, brady just means slow. No different than bradycardia, which is a slow heart rate. So bradykinesia, kinesia means movement, brady means slow. This actually is the hallmark of the condition. That means not everyone has to have resting tremor, but everyone has to have bradykinesia. If you don't have the bradykinesia, we question the diagnosis, okay? You may develop the bradykinesia later and the tremor first, but ultimately everybody with Parkinson's, all 100% everybody will have bradykinesia. And again, it's the hallmark of the condition. It can be manifested in multiple different ways. So from head to toe, you're looking at a decreased facial expression, a stoic expression, otherwise known as a masked face, mm -hmm. poker face if you will. A decrease in your ability to vocalize is really just bradykinesia of the vocal cords. Decreased arm swing just shows that there is bradykinesia of arm movement. So when you're walking and those people walk with a relatively decreased arm swing, that is reflection of bradykinesia or just a change in dexterity. The inability to be able to do dexterous activity because you're slow at doing so. Many patients will explain it takes me twice as long, or three times as long, or four times as long to just get ready in the morning. It takes me twice as long to put my pants on, or it takes me an hour to eat when normally it would take me 20 minutes. These are all reflections of bradykinesia, and then the neurologist has to be just that much more astute to be able to tease out is this bradykinesia, is what the patient describing bradykinesia, because I don't think to date I've had somebody come to me and go, I have bradykinesia. <laughs> you know, they usually give these type of descriptions. Rigidity. Rigidity is a stiffness in the movement. And I want to distinguish between what rigidity is and what spasticity is. How many people have heard either term? Okay. So let's start with rigidity. Rigidity, by definition, is an increase in the tone or resistance of the muscle throughout the whole movement. Okay, so when I'm in the office, and if any of you have seen a neurologist or had a neurologist perform an examination, we may move your arms around, or we may move passively move your leg around. What we're looking for is rigidity. We're looking to see whether the muscle tone is stiff throughout the whole movement. Okay, that's different than spasticity, which is also an increase in tone, increase in the, in, the, uh, in the resistance, but it's velocity dependent. Meaning that the quicker I go with my movement in passively moving your limb, the harder it's gonna get, okay? And that tends to be a sign of a spinal cord injury or a stroke. And so you won't get spasticity in Parkinson's, you'll get rigidity in Parkinson's. You'll get spasticity in stroke or a spinal cord problem. Any questions? Yes? Difference between Brady Kinney Bradykinesia. And rigidity. Because when you said rigidity, I thought um, my definition was for the bradykinesia. Right. So rigidity is stiffness. Bradykinesia is slowness. Okay? So you can technically have the slowness without the stiffness. It's very difficult, however, to have the stiffness without the slowness. Subtle, but that's usually what we look at. Most people who have bradykinesia will have... Um, I'm sorry, most people have rigidity will have rigidity. 
it's very difficult to rigidity and not the vertical nature. Now the last of the four is postural instability. What's that? So, I'm sorry? Okay. <laughs> so, what actually distinguishes us from the rest of the animals in the animal kingdom? We're standing on two feet. Okay? Most animals in the animal kingdom, they basically are on all fours. Right? So how is it that we're able to su support our whole body on two little areas of a surface area? It's because of the muscles that align our spine. Mm -hmm. When you stand upright, the muscles that flank the spine on either side are constantly contracting. You can feel that. You can feel that actually contraction. It relaxes when you lie down, okay? And it starts to contract as you sit up and of course more so when you stand up. It's also the same muscles that will help keep you upright when you're challenged. So for example, there's a gust of wind that blows and all of a sudden you're like, oh, but then you're able to capture yourself. Okay, or someone pushes you and you actually can take a few steps back and not fall down. That's postural <coughs> stability. Parkinson patients, usually from the get-go, have instability. They can't maintain their balance. They tend to fall. And they're more susceptible to falling, particularly if they go backwards, okay? So that's taking vision out of the picture because you're going backwards. That means you're entirely relying on those spinal muscles to keep your balance, and they just can't do it. Okay? They might be able to early in the course of the disease, but as the disease progresses, it's a difficult thing for them. So we tend to see Parkinson patients losing their balance in places where they're more likely to have to go backwards. Where would that be? Bathroom. Bathroom, number one place. Where else would that be? Not, ne not necessarily, depending on how big the bedroom is. So usually the bedroom is not the place of falling, um, except when you first get up from, the, from getting up from bed. But uh, almost always it's gonna be the bathroom and number two, the kitchen. And the main reason for the kitchen is there's so many things to navigate around the kitchen. Okay, there's an island, maybe a pantry behind you, cabinets up, cabinets down. And understand, going backward isn't simply just making this movement here, okay? If I were bent down, okay, and then I had to stand up again, that's technically going backwards, okay? If I'm going upstairs, where's my center of gravity? Right behind me, okay? that's going backwards even though I'm actually technically walking forward. So anything that puts your center of gravity behind you puts a Parkinson patient at risk of falling. Mm. And these are things that most neurologists don't quite appreciate. Most therapists, however, do. Okay? So any questions about, oh, I'm sorry. Exactly, about the posture. My uncle, when he was diagnosed, was diagnosed because of the vocal cords. Mm -hmm. He didn't right. have the tremors yet his movements weren't real slow, there was no rigidity. Right. He had fallen, um, but the doctor diagnosed him on the vocal cords, his voice was gone. Right, so the thing is that 99% of patients will be diagnosed on grounds of this. Uh -huh. It would be a rarity for someone to be diagnosed exclusively on the fact that they lost the pitch of their voice, particularly when there isn't any pathology in the vocal cords, right. okay? Mm -hmm. So many patients who simply have a decrease in the pitch of their voice, they'll maybe go to an ENT specialist um, and, or, or speech therapist of some kind, they'll actually have a laryngoscope that goes down and will look and see the vocal cords are actually working fairly well, just a little slow at what they do, and yes, pathologically you can make that diagnosis. But the reality is 99% of patients will actually have one of these four things or a combination thereof. So that makes, so in my practice, for example, I see about 1,000 Parkinson patients a year. And I can probably ha count on one hand how many people came to me with that diagnosis. That, that symptom is the initial symptom. Mm -hmm. So, which makes it a little challenging, by the way. Because mm -hmm. most neurologists um, are not astute enough to understand that uh, set movement disorder sort of neurologist. So many times patients who have an unusual presentation or a less than common presentation end up going from doctor, 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 doctor. Years go by, and finally the diagnosis is made. Speech therapy can help someone like that with the, the vocal with the, cord. With the port, yes. And, and that's, you know, practicing AAE really loud and those sort of things. So there actually is one FDA-approved speech therapy that is pretty commonly used, pretty universally used, called Lee Silverman Vocal Training. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to have a speech therapist that actually understands that, is certified in that, that would be able to um, give that type of treatment. So that treatment basically focuses around talking louder mm -hmm. and enunciating. It's a pretty aggressive approach to treating, uh, to doing speech therapy. 
problem, however, is that Medicare doesn't cover it. Okay? So in most um, health care organizations, we can't do it the way it's supposed to be done. The way it's supposed to be done is one hour per day, four days a week for four weeks. Okay? That's the original... Well, unless the years caregivers ago. do it with them. I mean, it's just Correct, but sitting no, in front of them and having them practice. But the caregiver won't have the expertise. They'll actually, I mean, they'll, they'll absorb some of what they understood in the, in the therapy session, but they can't do it the same way that the speech therapist would. Okay. So, I mean, one hour per day, four days a week for four weeks, there's no way that any healthcare delivery system is going to be able to provide that. Gotcha. So out-of-pocket expenses to a speech therapist that's working, um, you know, sort of in their own clinic, their private clinic, they can do it, and they get paid handsomely for it. So in that particular therapy, you're saying that that's really the only way to improve the vocal cord in someone like that. Oh, so okay. it's the only one known in existence at this point. Because we are currently doing that with one of our residents right now. We went to speech therapy and the exercise of what you know, speaking really right. loud and reading sentences. Right. But it just appeared to be where I mean, we're doing it with them three times per day. So, so where where this may change is leveraging technology. Okay. So it's really the same therapy again and again and again, right? So if you actually had it on video and using a video-based technology, you actually could technically do it every day. The problem is that's not billable at this point in time in this country. You can't bill for a video from it. That will change that sometime, I'm sure. The government always gets their money. Okay, let's talk about preclinical non-motor symptoms. Oh, I'm sorry. Is walking on the balls of your feet, the toes, um, is that associated with Parkinson's at all? Yes, but there's actually multiple different gait types when it comes to Parkinson's walking. So a lot of people have that shuffling gait, that classic gait pattern, where they make those pitter-patter steps and they have a stoop posture. Walking on just the balls of the feet or even the heels of the feet, I've seen both, and they're probably all equally common. There's some people who have what's called foot inversion, the foot turns inward. Okay, so they're walking on the outer edge of the foot. And then there's those people who have what's called festination or accelerated gait, where they make pitter-patter steps, but their momentum gets away from them, and they go quicker, 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 and they fall forward. Um, and then there's people who freeze. Okay, and that's probably the most challenging of all the gait symptoms, to where they could be walking and something visual obstructs them, and they can't take the next step. They just simply cannot do it. Okay, so does that answer your question? Okay. Correct. As long as he's walking with a cane, he's moving, but he can't just stop and wait for you. Right, and part of that is because if they're walking on the balls of their foot, there's very little surface area to be able to keep their weight. They're going to tip over. And when you gain momentum, you actually can. This is why tight ropers, right, they're not walking real slow when they're in the tight rope. The ones who are really good are walking real quick like, okay? It's because once they gain momentum, they actually have better balance. So it's, it's a sort of a negative feedback to the brain. The brain knows that if they go quicker, it's better for them. All right, preclinical non-motor signs. There's been a lot of research done over the past 15 years looking at certain symptoms that may predate the motor symptoms that we typically think of Parkinson's, okay? So it's, this is an effort to try to see what the cause may be. Some of these things that I've listed here may occur for years before the tremor ever started or before the slowness ever started. So anosmia, loss of the sense of smell, okay, constipation. Most Parkinson patients are constipated, okay, and a lot of it really has to do with gut motility. If your limb muscles are slow, your gut muscles are slow, which is why they're constipated. They just can't move the stool along. Sleep disturbances, REM, sleep behavior disorder. How many of you have heard of that? Okay. It's a very difficult diagnosis uh, to live with, okay, particularly for the bed partner, it's a fairly easy diagnosis to make in the clinic because you need the bed partner to actually give that history. So what are you, so typically in your sleep cycle, we kind of go through stages of sleep. Deep sleep, dream sleep, okay? During dream sleep, your eyes are rapidly moving, but you're not moving a limb. You're allowed to dream out your dreams. However, in deep sleep, you're not thinking a thing, but you're able to toss and turn. And you have to go through these full cycles multiple times per night to have a restful sleep. The problem with Parkinson's, that sleep architecture is disrupted. People now are able to act out their dreams. And more often than not, they're vivid, they're paranoid. You know, so the patient is running from something or is scared or frightful of something, is acting out, fighting someone. 
And who suffers? The spouse, the bed partner. They're the ones that inadvertently get hit or hear screaming uh, and are fearful for their loved one because they're the ones that fall off the bed. So typically, if not asked, we never address this. Only when asked does it actually come up. And it's fairly easy to treat in most individuals with a mild sedative. This can predate the diagnosis by many years. RLS, what's RLS? Restless leg syndrome, okay? Very commonly and tightly associated with Parkinson's disease. Not all, Parkin not all restless legs patients have Parkinson's disease, but many Parkinson's patients have restless legs. And the last is anxiety. I'm sorry, yes? I need to go back to the REM if you don't mind. Sure. It, it's, it's the first time my brain has thought that there was a difference in the Parkinson's being just purely physical, and when you were describing it, it sounded more yeah. like there's a psychological. Am I misunderstanding it there? Right. Um, so the REM sleep behavior disorder is, is strictly a sleep disorder. It's a pure sleep disorder, but highly associated with, with most Parkinson's syndromes, not just Parkinson's disease, but anything related to Parkinson's. <laughs> so what you're kind of getting at, at least forgive me if I'm wrong, is that Parkinson's is not just a motor disorder, okay? And that is usually um, a misconception amongst most individuals that Parkinson's, oh, it's that disorder that causes tremor. Sure, that's the thing you can see, but there's more than enough stuff that you and we're going to get to that. All right. So that gets to my next slide. Good segue. So what are the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's? And they are many. Okay? Anxiety. Yes. Anxiety. Did you skip that? No. So, so anxiety is one thing. So a lot of people, what they're looking at, if they look at these four things, anosmia, constipation, sleep disturbances, and anxiety, the likelihood, if you have all four of these before developing tremor or bradykinesia, the likelihood of having Parkinson's is greater than 50. But there's nothing to help prove that at this point in time. Everything is in hindsight. Of course, our hindsight is always 2020. <laughs> so non-motor symptoms. These are symptoms that are not typically thought of as Parkinson, but they're very much Parkinson. So neuropsychiatric and behavioral, okay? Many, many Parkinson patients will have symptoms of depression. They'll have symptoms of anxiety, panic attacks. Why? So if you look at the pathology of Parkinson's, it's really that there's a deficiency in producing dopamine. Dopamine's a neural hormone. It helps to initiate and regulate our movement. But also it helps to help stabilize our mood. Most antidepressants help to elevate the level of dopamine. If you look at people who have major depression, okay, without the Parkinson's, they have low dopamine levels. Okay, or they have fluctuating dopamine levels. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a neurologist to figure out that people with Parkinson's with low dopamine levels will actually go on to have abnormal mood. GI symptoms, we talked about the constipation. That happens to be the most common. Okay, there are GI side effects of medications which I won't get into, but the constipation is by far the most common symptom. Why? So if you look at the anatomy of the gut, you got the stomach, you got the small colon, you got the large colon. If the big guy upstairs intended for our gut to just simply be a, uh, a place of transit. It would have made the gut look like this. It isn't, it's this huge lumen that folds upon itself multiple times before getting down to where it has to go. Why? Because what's supposed to happen in the gut is extraction of nutrients and water. That's the actual purpose of the gut, is to make sure that what the stomach didn't capture, the colon does. In fact, most of our minerals, most of our vitamins are actually absorbed in the, in the colon, not in the stomach. So, if the, and the stool architecture, I mean, sorry, the colon architecture itself has a band of muscular tissue that goes along the length of it every few centimeters. And they work in a synchronous fashion. So if you have stool, it pushes it along, right? It's along the whole length of the gut, that's called peristalsis, correct. That peristaltic movement in Parkinson's is weak. So it makes a weak contraction, the stool stays where it is. But again, the, the purpose of the gut is not for transit, it's to extract water and extract stool. The longer it stays there, the harder it gets. And that becomes a big problem for patients. So I actually had a mentor about 10 years ago tell me that the most important part of somebody's day after the age of 50 is whether they had that doctor or not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it holds very true for our Parkinson's. Many of them actually will go four or five days. I've actually had a patient record where it was 17 days without it. Um, and those actually have to go to a GI specialist and be disinfected. 
Autonomic. I'm sorry, yes. A quick question about do the, um, the gut problems with Parkinson's patients typically trigger a weight loss, a fairly dramatic weight loss? Uh, no, not necessarily. So we're thinking here in unilateral lines, okay, that, oh, there's a gut problem because they can't eat so much, they're going to lose weight. There's many things that feed into our metabolism, many things that feed into whether we gain or lose weight. Parkinson patients, they tend to go for dessert first, usually, okay? Um, yeah, so it's not, it doesn't do a sense of smell, it's because they actually have an impulse to want to do that. And the circuitry uh, sort of allows it. So many patients will actually gain weight initially, okay? And over time, they'll start to lose weight because with the bradykinesia and with the poor activity, they start to actually have decreased metabolism. And so they don't eat so much, they don't do so much. And you would think, well, they're gonna gain weight from doing so, but they actually lose weight because of the rigidity. It's constant contraction of muscles. So the overturning of calories is higher. And so, you know, there's a lot of factors that feed into it. Bottom line is, they tend to gain weight initially, lose weight later. And it's not just the, uh, the GI motility that feeds into that. So autonomic, what is autonomic? So we have three different compartments to our nervous system. We got the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord. We got the peripheral nervous system, basically our peripheral nerves that help to give us the strength in our limbs as well as sort of give us the sensory input. And then we have the autonomic nervous system, which helps to take care of things that we don't voluntarily put any input into. Pupillary dilation and constriction, our heart rate, our GI motility, okay? Our blood vessels constricting and dilating, our temperature regulation, our blood pressure management. All these things feed into the autonomic nervous system and that is absolutely affected in Parkinson's disease, mainly because some of it is dopaminergically driven. You get low dopamine levels, the autonomic nervous system gets affected. Sleep, we already talked about REM sleep behavior disorder and restless legs and then cognitive, which is really why we're here. Do patients with Parkinson's get cognitive disorders? Answer is yes. There are multiple reports in the patient literature saying that up to 40% of Parkinson's patients will go on to develop dementia. And I think that's a very narrow view of the cognitive issues that Parkinson patients suffer. So greater or broader research now shows that anybody with Parkinson's at the time of diagnosis already has cognitive impairment. Okay, they already have shown subtle signs of, uh, of cognitive issues. And it may be difficult to tease out because they may be very highly functioning. So there are many patients who unfortunately come our way and are still doing the same job that they've been doing for decades and they do so very well, but when they're taken out of their element, they can't do well, they can't function well. So how many patients here have seen, or how many people here have seen that? So, so I see it all the time in my clinical practice. I see people who are high, you know, upper level professionals who come to our clinic who are perfectly fine in their professional arena, but when taken out of their element, they just can't do anything. Okay, and it really is a sign of dementia. So bottom line is you can have dementia and still be mentally, cognitively functional. Okay, you just have no room for reserve. None whatsoever, okay? And anything that impacts the brain, even a mild traumatic brain injury can push you over the edge. So I've seen many patients who probably have mild dementia, are still functioning well in their workplace, and then get into a mild head-to-head um, -head collision with their car. They really, not much damage to the car, but there's enough impact to the brain to where it just tips them over. So what's the cognitive issues that we tend to see in Parkinson's? Yes, I'm sorry. Just a quick question. I understand that it's true that Parkinson-related dementia can coexist with Alzheimer's. That is correct. That is correct, because the pathology is very different for both, okay? So what you may have already learned or understand is that Alzheimer's actually really affects the cortex of the brain, the surface of the brain. That's where that abnormal pathology is, or those abnormal proteins, or tangles, or the tau protein, that's where that mainly exists. And it's a connection between that and your temporal lobe, which is where our memory is housed, okay? With Parkinson's, it's a little deeper than that. So it's not so much on the surface or cortex of the brain, it's the connections between only. It's what we call a subcortical dementia as opposed to a cortical dementia. So the cortex or surface of the brain is where Alzheimer's is housed, Parkinson's dementia is deeper than that. So it really is a double whammy for people to have both, okay? And to show you uh, sort of the prevalence, 
Alzheimer's is about 70 to 80 percent of all dementias in the world. Everything else is the 20, 30 percent. Okay, Parkinson's is about 5 to 10 percent. So when we say that Parkinson's disease dementia or Lewy body dementia is the second most common, it's relatively speaking. Dementia is by far more common than the other two. In fact, it's far more common than all the other dementias combined and then some. Okay, so memory impairment. Consolidation and retrieval. Okay, what do I mean by that? So, to kind of take a layperson's view of how memory is uh, consolidated, if somebody gives you a piece of information, it doesn't automatically get card cataloged. Your brain processes it for a little while. We think about it, we marinate on it, okay, we digest that, if you will. And then we decide, at least, well, not, not uh, voluntarily, but basically our brain decides where to house that information. Typically, that in that sort of a holding pattern, you can only house about seven to ten pieces of information at any given time, which is why our phone numbers are only seven digits in length. <laughs> if they were eight, we'd invariably forget one number. Okay? Well, thank God for cell phones. <laughs> so um, once that information, if our brain figures out, okay, well, this needs to go here, it associates it and links it with something, typically with some super sense. Okay? This is why you can actually, and, and most of our super sense that it tends to be linked to is the sense of smell, okay? More memory is linked to the sense of smell than any other super sense, even more than the visual. You would imagine that it's the visual. It's not the visual, it's a sense of smell. So our sense of smell is so darn important. So this is why you can walk by a bed of roses, and for most men, I hope, you can re recall the time that you had given your wife those roses last. Exactly when and where, okay? And visual memory is almost as important, but, but you know, it's also another thing that we tend to link that to. So kind of imagine our memory uh, library like an actual old school library, to where there's a card catalog, you go to a section, that section is gonna be the super sense that it's linked to, and then the aisle is gonna be where that memory actually is. Okay, that's, that's sort of how our memory is housed. So that's the consolidation piece. How about the retrieval piece? Mm -hmm. Because of that, that strong association, we can pick up one or the other in order to find where that memory is. Again, just like a, you know, if you go into a library, you can go to the section you know where it should be based upon the association, or you go to the card catalog and figure out exactly where that book is, precisely where it might be. So this involves processing, processing to consolidate and processing to retrieve. It's the processing that's affected in Parkinson's disease. Yes? Would you please uh, differentiate uh, consolidation and encoding, which is the term I'm familiar with? Right. Um, they're usually one and the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. So coding actually is a little bit more precise, okay? Um, kind of sort of categorizing and coding how that memory should be. But I'm using the term a little bit broader here because I actually want to impress upon you that there's processing that's involved in making that consolidation, okay? So you actually, you actually digest that information and then you think about where you want to put it. So it's, it's the circuits that allow consolidation, it's the circuits that allow retrieval that are affected in Parkinson's. Not so much the actual library, it's the card catalog, okay? Um, because of the close association of memory with Hello. smell and because Parkinson patients tend to lose their sense of smell, this is one of the first few things to go. Yeah, we don't often test for it in the clinic. It's very difficult to test for it. Um, well, executive dysfunction. I'm going to get to that in a second, and that is the crux of Parkinson's disease dementia. And then there are medication-induced cognitive side effects, which you know, physicians need to be able to understand to realize what is med-induced and what actually is disease-induced. So when you're on Parkinson medications or other medications that might be given for symptomatic relief, patients can go on to develop hallucinations or paranoia, or vivid dreams, delusions, and psychosis. I'm gonna pay particular attention to hallucinations and delusions here, and what's the difference between the two. So a hallucination is patients actually seeing something visual, or hearing something that isn't actually happening, okay? And typically there's no stimulus. That's different from an illusion. So an illusion is when you look out onto a, uh, a field and you see a lamppost, and you mistake the lamppost for your dearly departed grandmother. That's an illusion. There's a stimulus there, and you mistook it for something else. 
a hallucination is that you see grandmother, but there's nothing there actually at all. You're completely forming that hallucination with no stimulus. That's the difference between the two. Parkinson patients, particularly when they're on too much medication, get visual hallucinations, not illusions, although they can get both. A delusion is thinking something that isn't actually happening. Okay? So, let's say that, so a delusion is thinking that my spouse is cheating on me. There's no basis for it, but it does happen. But they think it happens, and they may think it so strongly that they'll fight you tooth and nail for it. Okay? Now, one interesting uh, thing about hallucinations is that when you form a hallucination, you're forming it based upon whatever memory you may have of whatever it is you think you're seeing. That memory doesn't change, okay? It's whatever your uh, sort of, uh, whatever your memory is of that. So for example, I had a patient uh, just about six months ago who, it was a female patient, who thought her husband was cheating on her. So she was having a delusion. She thought that her husband's mistress was sitting on his lap when the two of them were watching television every night, sitting right next to her, okay? And obviously it wasn't happening because even, I, you know, of course as a physician I have to ask, um, uh, the, the kids were in, were in the clinic room with me and they said, no, there is absolutely no, there's no uh, you know, infidelity. When asked further about the hallucination, the wife, so the patient said that it was a woman in a red dress. She was wearing the same red dress every single day, every single time she was having that hallucination. Now, every self-respecting woman knows you're not gonna wear the same outfit every single day. And that's how I convinced her that it was a hallucination. Okay? That lasted about two weeks. Okay? And then she started having it again. Okay, what's executive dysfunction? This, this word comes up a lot in Parkinson's disease dementia. So again, when we talk about circuitry in Parkinson's, Parkinson's is what we call a circuitopathy, okay? There's a deficiency in dopamine. Dopamine is not produced well or not enough. And then whatever motor pathways or behavioral pathways that dopamine needs to take will ultimately be disrupted, okay? The drive from here to San Francisco, you take the, business, the regular 80. Maybe from here the business 80 or the regular 80. So the circuits is the road. Dopamine are the cars. Okay, so when somebody starts to develop executive dysfunction, it's actually the road that's affected. And you can imagine the problems it will cause. We don't often form compensating circuits, particularly not later in life. Like it's very difficult to do so. You can do so for motor function, not so much for cognitive function. Unless you started doing so early on in life. You were an academic to begin with. You were someone who liked to learn things and read a lot and process a lot, then you've developed compensatory mechanisms, and your reserve capacity is huge. But most people don't. Most people don't understand the relative importance of sort of mental exercises. We often, when we talk about exercise, we think about physical therapy, not mental gymnastics. So those people who are not in the habit of doing so have very poor compensation. So when those circuits fail, when that structure fails, you know, they start to show these impairments. And that is in the form of poor processing speed. It takes them longer to digest information, much longer actually. So you're talking to them and they got that sort of blank stare on your face. They're certainly not registering everything that you're saying. The difficulty in processing that information, so actually registered, not really sure what to do with that information or what it means for them or the insight or the judgment of what to do with that. Difficulty with organization, okay? They're not really sure Okay, well I got this information, I know it's important, uh, what do I do with it, where do I place it, and how is it relevant to today? Difficulty sequencing tasks, you give them a three, ta uh, you know, a three step task, they invariably will forget one or two. And certainly in that order, they won't give it to them in the order that you ask them to. And I'll have patients do something as simple as giving them a white sheet of paper, have them fold it lengthwise, and then again, and then put it on the ground. And what they do, fold it once, put it on the ground. I forgot the second step, even though I told it to them twice or thrice, and just two seconds ago. Word finding difficulty. They know what they want to say, they just can't say it. Okay, the processing of what that word is in their head to actually producing that speech is, is quite difficult, and that actually may be the initial symptom. They have a hard time giving talks. They have a hard time talking to their loved ones. 
talk, hard time talking to their colleagues or people at work. People who are in managerial positions, they notice this more. I have professors that I see who actually have executive dysfunction from Sac State University or for Davis that have this problem. Yes? They also, they don't know when to start the task or when to finish it. Correct. They don't know when to start talking and how to stop it. Correct. Correct. So the, the whole mechanism of speech production when it comes to cognition is affected. And then difficulty with expression. They just can't express themselves. They'll give you very fragmented sentences or fragmented answers. Why is it called executive dysfunction? Well, think about what an executive has to do for a large company. They just won't be able to do such things. So think Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Larry Ellison. Um, they just won't simply be able to manage something that involves so much cognitive um, type of work. Now, treatment options. Okay? A lot has been looked into this. The problem here is time of diagnosis. And that has been sort of a moving target. So often we make the diagnosis of dementia or cognitive impairment fairly late in the course of Parkinson's disease. Partly because healthcare today doesn't allow us enough time to sit and chit chat with our patients to where we can appreciate that. Many times the provider just simply doesn't ask. Many times the patient or the loved one simply doesn't know to ask. So this often gets pushed back, pushed back, because we many times just focus on the motor symptoms because it's easy to do. Mm -hmm. But I find with patient education, as long as you guys bring it up, it will or should be addressed. And many times we'll find that it actually started occurring well before we thought it should. So early diagnosis, early intervention, that's a key when it comes to cognitive impairment. Most of the medications that we have for cognitive memory retrieval or cognitive or task sequencing really is much better for those who have mild symptoms than for those who have moderate to severe symptoms. So anticholinesterase inhibitors, things like Aricept, Rizanidine, these medications can be wonderful early in the course of disease when patients will have mild cognitive impairment, not so effective later in the course of disease. When someone truly has Parkinson's disease dementia, this really is like a water pill. Methylphenidate, like water pill, like a placebo effect. Okay. Okay. Meth and it could be side effects to them because many of them do actually cause nausea and decrease in blood pressure. Many Parkinson patients already have decrease in blood pressure. <coughs> Excuse me. Methylphenidate, what's that? Ritalin, okay? Ritalin is a medication, old school medication given to ch children who have ADD, okay? Uh, attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity disorder, okay? It basically is an amphetamine. So you might wonder, why would we give an amphetamine, an upper, to someone who has hyperactivity disorder? It's because it focuses them. You over, you, you get, you over excite them to where they actually become focused, at least on specific tasks. And it works quite well for people with executive dysfunction, okay? And even nowadays, many behavioral or developmental pediatricians are giving it to young kids who have executive dysfunction because of genetic conditions. And it works fairly well. Problem is, Ritalin has a, or methylphenidate, in fact, unfortunately has a certain taboo behind it. Many providers don't like to prescribe it, okay? And so you have to find a provider who feels comfortable doing so. It isn't for everybody. But for those people who can manage taking it, it may not be an uh, unreasonable thing to do. In Parkinson's, by the way. Antidepressants, why do I mention this? Why would an antidepressant help a Parkinson patient's cognition? Because as you get older, we all hear about pseudo-dementia. Has anyone heard pseudo-dementia or that term? Mm -hmm. That many times, dementia is diagnosed when in reality, it actually is a mood disorder, and they're just simply depressed, okay? <coughs> so. Cognitive rehabilitation, what is that? So traditionally, many speech therapists will actually go on to do cognitive rehab. It's not common, okay, but that's usually what they would do. So it seems to go hand in hand. You do speech therapy with them. And if you look back at my previous slide, out of all these things, speech therapists could actually help people with, di with expression, with word finding difficulty. So it would be natural for them to also do some cognitive rehab, helping them when it comes to these type of tasks. And then community-based services. So there are cognitive rehab specialists in the community. They are few, but they are out there. But the other, and more recently, are going to be internet services. How many of you have heard of Lumosity? Okay, Lumosity is specifically targeting those people with executive dysfunction. 
as long as you know how to use a computer and a mouse and have internet connection. And it tracks your progress over time. It's a wonderful tool. Okay? Lumosity, L-U-M-O-S-I-T-Y, lumosity.com. In fact, there was a huge um, uh, commercial for Lumosity during the last Super Bowl. Okay? So if you, yeah. And so if you first, when you, uh, you put in your uh, username or whatnot and kind of profile for Lumosity, um, it'll actually do an evaluation. And then every day, it'll give you five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however long you want, uh, of basically games on the internet that really is tracking your executive function. And it can really help improve processing speed is what I've noticed the most in my patients. So I encourage most of my patients to do the most. Now, what are the indirect and direct effects that people have when it comes to cognitive impairment? I'm actually going to somewhat skip over this slide because I'm sure as you all are aware, it doesn't just affect the patient. Okay? It concentrically affects everyone around them. Their loved ones that are immediately with them, the extended family, it affects their work if they're still working, and certainly affects their long-term needs. This is why there's such a thing as dementia housing care. Okay, because those patients require a different level of care than those people who simply just had a stroke or something that was kind of, you know, one-dimensional. Now, that gets us to Lewy body disease, okay? So, this term gets thrown around a lot, and I actually really want to help define what it is. Many times with patients with Parkinson's disease who have cognitive impairment, their loved ones will come to me and go, are you sure he doesn't have Lewy body disease? Um, so I'll have to kind of go over the same spiel that I'll be giving you now. So, there are diseases that are called the Lewy body diseases, okay? And they can be Parkinson's disease, other related disorders, what we like to call Parkinsonism, ism just means like. So atypical Parkinson's, for example, multiple system atrophy, for example, progressive supranuclear palsy, and I certainly won't get into any of these. Um, and then the actual diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. Okay? So Lewy body pathology, it's a pathological term, okay, meaning that there's something in the brain called the Lewy body. All these diseases will have pathology that has Lewy bodies in them. Does that make sense? Okay. So what is that? Dr. Lewy, okay, he was basically a German neurologist that did a lot of bio study, uh, sorry, a lot of basic science studies. And he looked at autopsy brains of Parkinson patients and, re and Parkinson patients who had related disorders. And took these thin slices in specific areas of the brain, the cortex, the substantia nigra, which is the seat of Parkinson's disease, the basal ganglia, which is where most of the Parkinson pathology is. And he noticed that when looking at these slides under a microscope, after given a certain stain, which will affix that tissue to the slide, there's this big light pink area within the cell. You guys see that where the arrow is pointing to? You wonder, what is that? It's basically a storage unit. So to put it in layman's terms, as these cells die, it's a degenerative condition. So let's take Parkinson's, for example. As these cells die, what happens when they actually die? The cell structure breaks. Everything inside it gets spit out. The surrounding cells, okay, are quite anal. They don't like the mess. And they start picking up all those proteins and cellular structures because they don't like the mess around it. It, help, it slows them down. Okay? And they start putting them in their own cells. Okay? And putting it in these little storage units, that's a Lewy body. Okay? So the difference between what Parkinson's Lewy bodies are versus Lewy body dementia is just the location and how intense it is within the brain. In Parkinson's disease, you will only find these in the areas that actually Parkinson's affects the substantia nigra, the basal ganglia, and the projections from those areas. In Lewy body dementia, or dementia with Lewy bodies, and I've seen both interchangeably, it's all over the brain from the get-go. It's in the cortex, okay? The same area where the pathology exists for, for Alzheimer's disease. And in many of those patients, they have Alzheimer's pathology as well, which makes it much more difficult for them. This is the distinguishing factor between Parkinson's disease dementia, where they had Parkinson's for many years and over time developed a dementing process, 
and Lewy body dementia were from the get-go their dementia to begin with. And we'll get to the actual criteria of Lewy body disease. Any questions on that? Because this is unfortunately people are not quite sure as to what's a Lewy body and does my loved one actually have dementia with Lewy bodies? Can you repeat the location of the Lewy bodies Sure, substantia nigra. It's called substantia nigra because it's supposed to be a black substance because that area produces dopamine and a pigment called melanin. And melanin, if you look at it under a microscope, actually is black, so it's called substantia nigra. Um, that area produces dopamine and projects to the basal ganglia, which is the base of the brain, kind of where the brain meets the spinal cord. Okay, sort of like the stem of a flower area. And then those basal, the basal ganglia projects to other areas of the brain, but not all of the brain, there's many areas of the brain. And that's where you'll see Lewy body in an advanced Parkinson patient. Okay? Even if they don't have dementia, you will find Lewy bodies. So every Parkinson patient, even at the time of diagnosis, has Lewy bodies, but in select areas. On the other hand, a patient with Lewy body dementia will actually have it everywhere. And that's the one thing that Dr. Lewy has been so well credited for. Do you see that only in an autopsy, or can you that's see That's correct. That? So, it's, so it's an autopsy diagnosis. So what I tend to tell my patients is if we want a definitive diagnosis, we need an autopsy, most do not sign up for that. <laughs> Parkinson's disease dementia. However, in the literature, people who actually promote a lot of understanding of Lewy body dementia tend to claim that actually it's an underdiagnosed condition, and that is true. So the reality is we really don't know how many people in the general public actually have dementia with Lewy bodies versus those with Parkinson's. We can track our Parkinson patients, but it's very difficult to actually see how many people have Lewy body disease. The other thing is many times Lewy body dementia is actually misdiagnosed as Parkinson's dementia, um, which really by the time Parkinson patients develop dementia, there's very little that distinguishes them clinically. But many Lewy body patients are actually misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease because they have similar pathology. If you look under a microscope, of, uh, of an autopsy brain of a Lewy body de dementia patient, they don't have Alzheimer's pathology. The majority of them will. They'll have both. My wife, 15 years of uh, Alzheimer's, I've been going to the meetings. Now I find out she's got Lewy. Right. That's the most common, most common misdiagnosis. And it's of no fault to the neurologist. It's a very difficult diagnosis. Very difficult. Yes. I, I actually work in a dementia Yes. What, what actually got me to call the neurologist because what someday I mean she would go two or three days and she was as lucid right. and she was all the other and then all of a sudden God was talking to her and she was out to kill everybody I mean she really right. and but she never actually got the motor symptoms right. and that's why he never he said that's why he didn't diagnose her with Lewy body because she never showed motor symptoms. So this is the thing. So let's talk about these three clinical criteria. So this is the currently accepted clinical criteria, at least major criteria, for making the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. So now we're going to move away from Parkinson's disease dementia. These patients have fluctuating cognition. What does that mean? That means one moment they can actually be quite lucid, and another moment be completely off the wall wild. And it really could be like night and day, OK? And the loved one or those who are around the patient are the ones who describe it best. The patient themselves will actually be quite, uh, they'll, they'll neglect it. They don't actually know. They'll actually have, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be unbeknownst to them. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, so that actually is one of the major clinical criteria. Often, that information is not brought to our attention. Okay, because sometimes it's misunderstood or not seen well. Okay. Uh, later in the course of disease, it becomes actually more obvious. But early in the course of disease, not so much. Visual hallucinations, that's the most common reason we actually see the patient when it comes to our thinking that it's DLB or dementia Lewy bodies. So again, we already talked about visual hallucinations and what it is. And then Parkinsonism, or some symptoms of Parkinson that typically occur one year after the other two have started. Okay. So this is one of the timeline distinguishing factors between Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. Many patients with dementia with Lewy bodies will develop Parkinson's symptoms well after they already have had the fluctuating cognition and the visual hallucinations. Although some of them, like you said, sir, were actually misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's. 
Um, on the other hand, Parkinson's disease, dementia, they've had the motor symptoms for years, 10 years, 15 years, and now are developing visual hallucinations and fluctuating cognition. That's more likely to be your garden variety Parkinson's disease, dementia, okay? Now, why is it challenging here? Be number one, mainly because of this sort of relationship between dementia, Lewy body disease, and Alzheimer's pathology, which you don't often see Alzheimer's pathology in Parkinson's disease, dementia. But again, these are all research terms. These are all things that you look at in an autopsy. It makes it very challenging in the clinical setting in life, okay? Um, and then the other thing is, all this isn't often known to us because of the fluctuating cognition. Yes? Do the Lewy body show up in any kind of imaging? No, it does not. Yeah, it's a pathological, uh, it's a histopathological diagnosis, so you need biopsy. Yes? Does the fluctuating cognition have to be quite as night and day? No, it doesn't. Yeah, it can certainly be less intense, but more often than not, it's like night and day. So if, if someone was pretty lucid most of the time, but every once in a while, thought something that was there, right. really can't see because of glaucoma. <laughs> right. So you know what happens in those cases more often than not is they get diagnosed with a psychiatric condition. Okay, so they get diagnosed with having, you know, psychosis or or uh, depression with psychotic features. We see that often. In, I'm sorry. Or UD. Or what? UD. Oh, urinary. Oh, yeah, urinary tract infection. Although urinary tract infection, by the way, can amplify any Parkinson's symptoms. So we see that often. Yeah. In, in dementia with Lewy body yes. syndrome, when it first starts up. They may not be that often. They may be quite infrequent. So, so if you have infrequent visual hallucinations and infrequent low levels of cognition, again, it may just be that they had a psychotic episode, and that's it. And that's what they were diagnosed with. And now they're in the psychiatric clinic, never having seen the neurologist. Yeah. What about delusions? Are delusions all seen? Delusions and visual hallucinations will go hand in. They more often have visual hallucinations. Why? Because typically you'll have Lewy bodies in the visual cortex. That's what that visual hallucination. So they will have an abnormal sense of smell, yes. But again, not often asked. Yeah. They will also have REM sleep behavior disorder. Mm -hmm. So there are actually what we call minor criteria. These are major criteria part of, of, of dementia of Lewy bodies, and there's minor criteria, of which the loss of sense of smell is one, REM sleep behavior disorder is another. And then there is such a thing as what's called a DAT scan. How many people have heard of a DAT scan? That's a dopamine axonal transport scan. So many uh, movement disorder neurologists believe that dementia of Lewy bodies is really just along the same spectrum of diseases that Parkinson's is on. So there's dopaminergic loss. So there will be an abnormal DAT scan, which is in every facility. The problem here is if you obtain a DAT scan, it can't distinguish between dementia of Lewy bodies versus Parkinson's disease. It just tells you there's a dopamine problem. So again, it's only used as a research tool, yes. This morning, Dr. Edgerly was talking about the possibility of, um, in probably the next 10 to 15 years, actually being able to see amyloid and tau That's on correct. some type of imaging, whether it be PET or MRI. Do you think we will ever get to the point where Lewy bodies will actually be visible or no, not, because, not possible because right, so tau, of their... Tau proteins tend to be bigger, okay. and nerve fibrillar tangles are huge. So you certainly could see that on a current spec or a, or a PET. And in fact, actually, we do PET scans for Alzheimer's patients, and we're not, we're not sure it's Alzheimer's or not. So what I'm hopeful for is if you were to couple a DAT scan, at least the future generations of what a DAT scan is, with a PET scan looking for amyloid, then you could tell whether they have Lewy bodies, because most Lewy body patients will actually have uh, Alzheimer's pathology. It will help to clinch a diagnosis without the need of these type of criteria. Yes? When my, first, my husband first started having symptoms, first was the REM disorder, then he um, started falling. Yes. And then uh, we were with Houston Davis at the time, and they did a whole series of uh, ear, they oh, had him oh. having Meniere's disease. Oh, right, yeah. And as it turned out, he did not have it. He Yeah, the thing is that medicine, and in particular neurology, heavily relies on our clinical impression. A lot of what we do in neurology is based entirely on the history. 
entirely on the framework that we're thinking when you're giving us the history. And if, it be, if they captured that in piece of information and they thought, let's go that route, then unfortunately it's kind of difficult to stop that. So I think, I think what's most important um, when you're seeing a new patient is the history they give. The exam is actually secondary. I mean, how would an exam help you with a dementia Lewy body patient? It wouldn't, right? Because how can you examine visual hallucinations or fluctuating cognition? You really have to capture that on the history. So it's a matter of sifting back through the medical record, if there's an electronic medical record, and then going through asking all the pertinent questions. And hopefully a light bulb goes off and will steer them in the right direction. Yes. Um, I have three questions for you. Um, first of all, I want to know how hereditary Parkinson's is because okay. I've got a ton of it in my family. I want to know the difference between rigidity and cognitive rigidity. Okay. And I want to know what Kaiser you work at. <laughs> uh, so the last question I'll answer first, that's the easiest. Uh, Sacramento at the Morris Avenue facility. Um, cogwheel rigidity versus regular rigidity. All cogwheeling is, is rigidity superimposed on tremor. So if you have tremor, and then you try to examine them, because the tremor tends to kind of cut its way in, you get this ricketiness when you're actually trying to examine them. That's called cogwheel. Um, and I'm sorry, your first question was? Hereditary. Oh, the hereditary. So yes, it can be hereditary. 95% of all Parkinson patients are spontaneous Parkinson's, okay? Um, however, if you have a family history of it, that actually goes up for you. So if you were to actually look at 100 people with Parkinson's, 95 of them would actually have gone on to develop for unknown reasons, okay, or for because of spontaneous reasons. But 5% of them certainly would have a genetic predisposition or a genetic cause. Now the question here is, is it entirely genetic? Is it entirely environmental or a combination of the two? We don't know. Yes? A client with, of mine with Lewy body dementia, Sometimes it's lucid, and other times, most of the time, it's going la 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 la, and sometimes very loudly yes. and upsetting all the other residents in the facility. Yes. Can you speak to that? Um, so we're not entirely sure why many Parkinson's disease, dementia, and Lewy body patients actually do develop that. It's almost like a vocal restlessness. Okay. So if you've noticed, Parkinson patients, at least with dementia, if, if you've been around any. Um, they actually can't sit still. You gotta get up, sit up, get up, sit up, get up, sit up. And that's almost like a vocal representation of that. That's my impression. There's really no rhyme or reason as to why they're doing that. They're disruptive, why? And they're not gaining anything from it either. Okay, so there's no secondary gain. But, uh, but the way I view it is it's a vocal restlessness. There unfortunately is no good way to treat it. So the problem, again, this is the one point I wanna make up before we finish off here, is the problem with giving patients with uh, when a patient with Parkinson's disease dementia, you can give them certain medications. You can't do the same with dementia with Lewy bodies. They have terrible med sensitivity, okay? Particularly when it comes to antipsychotics. The knee-jerk reaction of all primary care physicians and neurologists when a, when a dementia patient, regardless of the cause, is behaviorally acting out, is to go ahead and give them Haldol and give them Seroquel and give them Risperidol and snow them because it's easier for everyone else. Dementia patient, uh, sorry, dementia Lewy body patient will suffer more than the rest. It actually may be the right thing to do for an Alzheimer's patient. It may be the right thing to do for a Parkinson patient with dementia. It certainly is not the right thing to do for a dementia Lewy body patient. Um, on rare occasion, it might work, but the majority have med sensitivity. In fact, that's one of the minor criteria. So, what kind of medication do you recommend for this? You withdraw medications. You actually, because if you think about it, and this holds true somewhat in Alzheimer's as well, is that you already have a compromised brain, particularly at the level of the cortex. And when you give neurotropic and psychotropic medications, you compromise them further. So it's almost best to take a step back and look at the list of medications they're on and start to subtract. Do they just play a factor in either of these two? So Parkinson's disease, the average age of onset is age 61. 61, 62, okay? And dementia with Lewy body disease, 68 but I've seen a huge range. So that, that, I never really give that information out because I've seen Parkinson patients at the age of seven for genetic reasons. And I've seen it develop after normal. And, and those bodies, is that more common than like over 90? No, not necessarily. Yeah, and I don't think there's enough research to tell. So actually I've been told that uh, <laughs> we're, we're out of time because I guess there's other things for you all to go to. But um, thank you very much.